GPS. Where am I? Navigation. From the compass to paper maps. Instant GPS and life made easy with MapQuest and Google Earth. Coordinates that today find your location and give you directions to coffee, burgers, sports, doctors, detours around traffic, and show you someone's house on the other side of the world. Who knew that America's property system was implemented by this man, Rufus Putnam? In 1796, President George Washington appointed Rufus as America's first surveyor general. Rufus set out on foot or horseback to direct surveys in the Wild West. Back then, the West consisted of Ohio, what is today the Midwest. Survey is the art of measuring angles and elevation on the Earth's surface. It requires math and science. Today's surveyors use this manual of surveying. It's full of math equations. Now, the history books tell us that Rufus Putnam wasn't the best of math students, but sharp enough to get America's public land survey system up and running and implement policies for townships and plats and a system to keep copies safe. So if something happened to the records in the field, like they fell into a river or got burned in the Wild West, there would still be copies in a place called the General Land Office. Today, we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the General Land Office, and we want to take you into the field to explore the world of surveying. Our exploration begins with a descendant of Rufus. Meet Patrick Putnam. Rufus was his ancestor uncle. Patrick, just like Rufus, works for the federal government at the Bureau of Land Management in Phoenix, Arizona. Jeff Graham works there too in cadastral surveying, continuing the work of the General Land Office. What I was wondering is, if Rufus was out here in his day, what equipment would he be using and, and what is it? He didn't have the GPS. All that kind of stuff. Oh, here we go. You know, the first time I found out about it, uh, as Rufus Putnam was in my high school uh, American history class. And there was a guy named Rufus Putnam, and it intrigued me, so I asked my father. Um, and turns out we're directly, we're, we're a descendant of Rufus Putnam. So this is pretty cool. This is an original marker from 1878 and it's still here I guess you used to be able to see you can see a little bit of the the writing but it seems to have uh, gotten burnt but uh, pretty amazing to see something that old on this tree so if the surveys were done way back then why is surveying why is this profession and job still important today well, look at these cabins in the forest. People bought them, and they think they own the cabin and the land. But part of that land, it belongs to the Coconino National Forest. Now, surveyors have to return here and use more modern technology to identify lines of land ownership. Right, absolutely, so that if people are buying a piece of public land, I'm sorry, a piece of private land, right up next to public land, they can be assured that they're buying their privately owned stuff and not having to worry about having put uh, chunks of their land on, on the public lands. That was the first lesson Patrick learned on day one of his journey exploring the profession of surveying and the type of work that his ancestor uncle, Rufus, created. When Rufus was appointed, he ended up having to you know, start from the beginning and he established some uh, standard protocols that have been become standard throughout the lifespan of the General Land Office and consequently then the Bureau of Land Management. Jeff and Patrick recap their first day on the road, learning about surveying plats, maps, townships, and land controversy. What did Patrick think? You know, I, I guess one of the most interesting things is this case that was going on, and it's written up actually in, uh, in, a, in a journal here, um, the American Surveyor, and it's area that we went and visited out in Mountain Air and just outside of Flagstaff and where there were 27 homeowners that were informed that their, uh, what they thought was theirs was actually uh, belonged to the Coconino National Forest. And so as a result of that, it's gone to Congress to try to do a, uh, um, 
try to get them the ability to get their lands back, and that's before Congress right now. And the journey continues. Jeff and Patrick hit the road again, traveling towards Window Rock, Arizona, the capital of the Navajo Nation. Well, we're out on the Navajo Reservation, kind of a uh, beautiful painted country. And from what I understand, we are doing uh, actual work that the Cadastral Survey has been employed to do, surveying some portion of the Navajo boundary. The Navajo Nation, 17 million acres. Most of it is here in northern Arizona, some in New Mexico and a little bit in Utah. But most, most of this land has never been surveyed. I've been told I'm going to dig holes and we're going to put steel caps or brass caps. Uh, we're going to stamp them and put them in the ground and that will be a marker. The BLM cadastral survey crews are working with the Navajo surveyors. The first step is to set up a satellite base station. This represents uh, the center quarter of section two. While Rufus Putnam would have traveled by foot and slept on the ground, today's surveyors use tough trucks, quads, and most important, modern equipment. That GPS device is radio linked to the base station, sharing satellite signals to keep everyone on track. Today, the land surveys are so accurate they're measured within one centimeter. While accurate, this work is physical and it takes a long time to mark every one half mile of a township. This project began in 1982 when Navajo surveyor Daniel Bryan was a younger man. Oh man, there's plenty to do. There's, uh, I was told back when uh, uh, there's a delegation that came in from Washington back in 83 and we met at the Navajo Tribal Council Chambers and out there, that's where they told me that, you know, as young as you are, I was one of the youngest. And, and he said, hey, one guy pointed me out and said, as young as you are, you're not going to complete this. And he was right. I'm, I'm getting up there, and I don't think I'll finish it. <laughs> Using accurate GPS coordinates, surveyors navigate to pre-calculated positions and begin digging a hole about two feet deep. The top of the monument is a brass cap, and the township and section numbers are hammered and stamped by hand at each location. The marker, called a corner monument, is placed deep in the ground. Measurements are checked to ensure the position. Stone mounds are creatively placed either around the marker to keep it in place or next to it so that it can be easily and quickly found by future land users. Yeah. <laughs> Put the paper over here and we're going to rub, rub the pencil over the paper while the paper is on top of this cap and I'll give an impression of how the caps mark so that whenever we send our field notes into review. Review can uh, make sure that we stamp this cap right. The surveyors document details in field books to reference later when creating official land records. With the first monument marker in place on this day, the crews load up their quads and are off to the next location. Now that the professionals have shown Patrick Putnam how it's done, it's his turn. While he digs, others start searching for rocks and preparing the markers and keeping an eye on Patrick. Putnam, how does this differ from your desk job? <laughs> this is much nicer. <laughs> he likens this job to gardening at home. I feel like I'm at home digging holes in my yard. So we get to plant tomatoes? Yeah, there you go. You might have a little difficulty growing. <laughs> the next location takes us on the slope of a hill, and the next corner monument must be placed in the exact location one half mile from the last one, even if Putnam has to dig on a slanted surface. But that's just as important. You're chipping at the corners at the base for a good square cylinder at the bottom for a flat ridge. And the work continues, checking the maps, writing to the next location, exactly one half mile from the last, verifying the GPS measurements, 
digging, setting monument markers, securing them with stones, and after a good night's sleep, kidding up and doing it again. Well, you know, I think as long as you can tolerate the wind, the sand, the heat, the cold at times, um, not a bad job. Um, I think uh, it takes the right person to do it day in and day out, but um, just the absolute beauty, the being outdoors every day. Um, I, I think the stress level would kind of begin to leave one's body. With 15 of the 17 million acres still to survey in the Navajo Nation alone, an entire 30-year career could be spent out here. I heard stories about uh, knee replacement, shoulder surgery, uh, back. Uh, the whole thing is to try to keep your body healthy through the whole process. Thinking about what it must have been like for Rufus and his crew. Um, no ATVs, uh, mostly on foot. Uh, maybe some horseback, but uh, um, they probably never had an idea of what the next hill would bring as far as navigational difficulties. And when encountered, had to deal with it. Instead of getting five markers in, maybe they could only get one because of the difficulties of getting to that next spot. I, I think it must have been just an absolute exciting, exciting career uh, charting uh, the United States, not knowing what the next day would bring. Uh, uh, very exciting. I'm sure kept him young and made him old all at the same time. Now you're gonna you're not gonna take this out. <laughs> well, not easily. Never say never. <laughs> never <laughs> We got ten. Ten for the two days. I think we're moving on to go explore other aspects of what can ask for us. Alright, we're on the road again, day four. What's on the agenda today, Jeff? Traveling to Window Rock, Arizona, <clears throat> to the Navajo Indian capital, and to visit with the uh, land department, our liaisons with the uh, Navajo Nation. Here in Window Rock, Arizona, the surveyors meet with the land department of the Navajo Nation. This is where the tribal members come to get a homestead. This office began issuing homestead leases back in 1953, but that's hard to do when you do not have a survey or a legal description for the land. The old custom was that tribal members only used the land and did not lease it. The land descriptions were verbal, passed from generation to generation. Today, the Navajo population exceeds 350,000 and the nation wants a better system. And so now our customary use area, even our, within our family, right. is shrinking. And so we learn that we have rights, we learn all these things, and so we want to, um, to utilize our rights. So what we have are these documents that say, my land is this, I got this, I have a lease, I've been given a permit. And so those types of uh, disagreements happen every day. And so that's why these monuments now and the land descriptions on permits and leases that are now issued have to be defined um, so these people's all rights will be protected for one thing and to have some kind of civil order as knowing exactly where your piece of property is. Originally, land here was used for grazing. The tribe wants to improve the health of the land by reducing grazing. To this day, the rancher has to give consent for one acre of his customary grazing land to become a homestead before a lease can be issued. Other land is being taken or held by the tribal government in eminent domain for schools, hospitals, and roads. And when a new homestead is issued, the new residents are going to the banks to obtain mortgages. Banks will not give loans without the legal land description and government documents. So, the birth of a government, of a new town, 
of a community of homes all depend upon obtaining legal land descriptions based on land surveys and answering that question, where am I? Navigating and surveying America is still vitally important today. And could Rufus have known that his descendant nephew, Patrick, would retrace his career path all these years later, each step of the way, taking part in every aspect of what surveyors do, taking a rubbing of the monument in his journal, proving that on this day in 2012, Patrick Putnam, a relative of America's first surveyor general, would set out and mark a new corner monument, continuing the process started over 200 years ago for the General Land Office, and that Patrick was at this location assisting the growth of the Navajo Nation. 200 years from now, maybe my great-great-great-granddaughter will come out and find the cap that I helped put in.